everyone, and welcome to an exciting edition of ARG Presents. I'm your good pal, your good buddy, Amigo Aaron, joined by a man who, much like today's topic, is far less than the original. I give you my brother, the Brent. Uh, no, it's different than the original, and, and, and thank the Holy Spirit for that. The, pff, you kidding me? No one thinks that, Brent. You're clearly a lesser carbon copy. So, <laughs> If you joined us last week, we spun the wheel. We made the deal, Brent. And thanks to a little guy I like to call Bam, Chris Bolds. Chris Bolds. We're playing sequel games that are not like the original. Aren't like the original. Now, this is a, a provocative uh, line of thought here, Brent. Because, there, of course, in the video game world, sequels are as common as mud. They're everywhere. Yes. And usually the theory behind a sequel is you stick close to the original uh, and you uh, go down the line of what's successful. You give them more of the same. That's right. That's right. So these are games that are different in many many ways. And I wanted to go over a few of these with you that you could think of right off the top of your head, stuff that we didn't cover uh, that that would fit the category. Before you ultimately settled upon what you picked, what did you end up uh, thinking about? Well, I think we, we, unlike most days, we actually talked about this for a brief moment. <laughs> yeah, that's <clears> true. <throat> and uh, the very first game I think both of us thought of was Dig Dug. Yeah, that was because one that of the first game, the, the original of that versus the, the sequel, two completely different games. Yeah. Uh, and not for the better, in my opinion. Yeah. I would, you know, one of the ones that came to my mind instantly, and, and uh, Buck Owens mentioned it here in the chat, was the Mr. Do series. I think you sort of poo-pooed that. But yeah, they are, I don't consider those sequels. Well, they are those radically are just, different. What do you mean they've got Mr. Do in them? No, just because you have the same character doesn't mean it's a sequel. See, these are the con- this is the kind of controversy we talked about. I also thought about Donkey Kong 3, which is a radical departure uh, from the first two. Yeah, uh, I mean, even Donkey Kong Jr. is pretty different, but it's still sort of bounced around on platforms. Donkey Kong Three turned the Donkey Kong franchise into a, into a, basically a shmup, a shoot 'em up, uh, with mixed results. Uh, uh, you know, it was eh. Another one that came to mind was the uh, uh, Fallout series. It was started out as sort of a, a real time strange thing, whatever, and it turned into what it is now, for yeah. better or for worse. That depends on your perspective. Some of the folks here in the chat have... I asked the question beforehand. Street Fighter 2010, that's a good choice. If you played that, that was nothing like Street Fighter. That's for sure. A horrible game. Alien Breed 3D. Yeah, that's one you could go with. It's the it's the games that had sequels that decided to take the franchise in the 3D, Brent. Well, and see, I, I also think that's a little bit different. Uh, that is using... Trying to evolve with technology... And I certainly don't fault games. I mean, I don't fault. I, I love it when games try new things. Uh, but I think that is a, a not as true to the the topic at hand, only because you have to eventually evolve your game, right? So I do you. Well, that is what about certainly worms? valid. Even, I guess even worms evolved it to a certain extent. But I mean, right. they still make 2D and 3D versions, so well, and they can, need to stop. You could keep milking that franchise forever. <laughs> no, sure you can. No, stop milking it. So, give me some examples that come out of your brain. Uh, of course, you've got the the Super Mario Brothers two for the U.S. Uh, was radically different from uh, Super Mario Brothers. Do you count Super Mario Brothers the original as a sequel game to Mario Brothers because that yep. was very different. Absolutely. Yep. And then, you, it's kind of odd, after they got to uh, Super Mario Bros. 3, and it was more like the original Super Mario Brothers, and then they took it 3D and, and took it into space, that is a game that is happily evolving uh, and, and mixing it up. So, uh, kudos to them. I think that they could have easily stuck to their guns, and I'm not saying that every um, Mario game is a winner. That is obviously not the case. But... It was uh, uh, always evolving the series, and I think that's what kept it relevant for so many years. Yeah. I uh, Well, and still to this day. I want to mention that that hilariously Duncan Styles said Popeye 3, the wrestling Popeye, which was on the the computers. Horrible, horrible game uh, that I unfortunately had to play 
Now, can you think of games, Brad? This is just a side topic here. I'm going to throw right. it out. What about games that needed to evolve and never did? We mentioned Worms. And ultimately, Worms, Worms did develop that 3D version that everybody hated for years before they finally got it right. Can you think of any other games? And I'm going to throw out some that I thought, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you know, the if something like the Mario series, if you kept it going forever the way it was, it would have gotten old. But they managed to really change it up a lot, so you wouldn't count something like that. But you might count... Something like a uh, oh, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head. What do you got? That, something that they needed to change the series. That's not worms. Uh, okay. Well, it, this is kind of a. I don't know if you'll count this, but the whole Telltale series. Uh, you know where these they are they the interactive fiction things, right? Yes, <clears throat> and they they put out a ton of those across all time types of genres and and story plots. But the gameplay loop was always the same. Yeah. And while it lived and died by its writing, ultimately people got tired of doing the same thing, and the series never evolved, and now it's pretty much gone. Yeah. So I think that is a prime example of a series of games that needed to evolve and simply didn't. We got some good suggestions here in the chat. A Twilight Zoner mentioned Smash Bros. It's sort of stayed on the same path for a long time. Uh, and Texas Foosball mentions Lemmings. They really didn't change. I mean, they changed Lemmings a little bit, but not a ton. Uh, and it's pretty much been the same game ever since. Uh, it's an interesting topic. You know, we did have a... Uh, every once in a while, we get lucky. And so we have a million different ideas as to what we can do on the show. And so it wasn't hard to pick one this week, was it? No, no. Yeah, I, and we both did not pick Dig Dug. Although, again, that, it's funny that we both thought of that. I don't know what that means. Yeah. And now, you know, just real quick, what do you think of Dig Dug 2? Garbage. No. Yeah, it's garbage. <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad. No. <laughs> well, listen, whatever, whatever. So, with all that said, uh, the Brent, uh, we had a, a, an easy choice this week. I'm going to lead the dance here uh, this time around with my offering and I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, 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 I kind of, once I started playing it again, I thought maybe I d shouldn't have picked it, but the die was cast. You gave it the thumbs up, so I went ahead and went with it. The game I chose was, bam, it's Blue Max 2001, Brent. Yes. Blue Max 2001. Now, uh, Blue Max 2001 was the sequel to the wildly popular and successful Blue Max uh, and this was released on the C64 and the Atari 8-bit. Now, I played both, but I focused my efforts on the C64 this week. Yeah. Uh, this released in 1984 by Synapse Software and coded by the same fellow that did Blue Max, Bob uh, Poland. He did both versions of this, by the way. He did the C64 and Atari version, so Bob had some skills uh, to uh, in this game. The music in this was done by Ahor... Uh, Wolosinski, tough name. Uh, he also did Sim Golf and Live Billiards too. I will say that people that worked on this game worked on very little. For example, Bob Poland, aside from working on Blue Max and Blue Max 2001, only did one other game, Puzzle Panic, and then retired. He retired soon after this game was released. So hmm. isn't that astounding that a guy who had so much success with Blue Max uh, the the popular game uh, retired so quickly. You know he's out. He's Absolutely. out. He's out of the loop. Uh, this game, of course, one player and was uh, priced at about thirty U.S. dollars in release, uh, Brent. So pretty much standard fare for the time. Now, if you haven't played the original, because it sort of needs to be talked about, the original Blue Max put you in the in the uh, role of a World War One pilot who goes on raids. Across the countryside in his uh, uh, in his biplane, and drops bombs and shoots air, aerial targets on his way uh, to just basically trying to help extend the war effort in a vertically scrolling sort of a Tron style, uh, you know, like a shooting game, but with you know it's outdoor aerial and it was real nice. And you flew over the countryside, you t blew up factories, you blew up boats, bridges. Uh, you occasionally would have to land your plane to refuel and to get it fixed. It was a real popular game. You were a big fan of that one, too, weren't you, the Brent? I was. That was nothing like Tron. No visuals no, for, no. like, Tron. What did the I plot say? wasn't did I Tron. Say Tron. I meant Zaxxon. My bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's amazing that blue mics they both had blue in them no uh, zach side zach side so uh so people like that game it was a lot of fun and it was when you when you heard there was a sequel i got very excited back in the day and then blue max 2001 honed into view so let's get into what this is now a lot of people don't know much about Blue Max 2001. They may have heard of it, but they don't know the full scoop. So I dug deep, brother, to uh, see what the sto story is, because this one has a story. Uh, it's 2001, the lofty, faraway year of 2001. Think about that, Brett. This game was placed in the future that was 21 years ago, right now. Uh, in this <laughs> game, uh, it's it, you are flying a flying saucer. You're trying to bomb enemy targets while not getting shot. Okay, pretty simple stuff. But why are you doing this stuff? Well, guess what? It did have a backstory. You play the you play the ancient future ancestor of <laughs> of the original guy here. I'm gonna read some of this, bro, just because you get a feel of it. This is that classic sort of baloney that people that grew up in the '50s might come up with. So I'm guessing I'm just <laughs> kind of get. I'm just saying this. Re, hear this backstory, and you'll understand. So here's the objective: You are Max Chatsworth. The Ninth, a direct descendant of Max Chatsworth of Blue Max Spain. You have lived and breathed his legend, and now fate calls upon you to fight an evil so foul that he could not have imagined it. The Furks Empire, that's F-U-R-X-X, -X, all capitalized, and it's that's the way it's spelled throughout the entire manual. The Furks Empire has extended its iron hand to Earth Base Gamma 4 and captured it. The inhabitants were not killed in the struggle. The, no, excuse me. The inhabitants that were not killed in the struggle were enslaved and sent to the Furex conversion process to be drained of their life force so that the Furex time masters could extend their own lifespan. Having effect, having effected an easy victory, the Furex now intend to invade all Earth colonies and finally capture the Earth itself. You have been armed with a deadly gravitonic penetrator whose power beams can cut through Ferk's defense screens like a laser through a tin can. Rebels have set up supply bases in secret locations on the planet where you can uh, be refueled. Your mission is to penetrate enemy defenses, destroy their hover fields, and finally destroy the symbol upon which the Ferex Empire is built. And all this must be accomplished immediately, for the fate of the world rests in your hand. There you go. That's quite a plot. Who'd have thunk it for this game? You got that side of kind of plot, Brent. So that's the plot. Let's actually talk about what the game is. Uh, this game starts off just like Blue Max, sort of. You are on a landing field or a runway. The difference is you're on a cratered up, like I would say, moonish looking area or maybe yeah. Mars. And your UFO looks like a, maybe like a donut, like with some flickering lights. Uh, this, it's like a flying saucer. It, well, I mean, kind of. It's not really round, though, is it? Saucers are round. This thing's more kind of like oblong, you know, I guess because they couldn't really do round. Am I wrong? Well, it's also you're an isometric view. Well, pff, listen, you're really struggling to help this guy out. So you start on the ground. Now, right away, you're going to see instant differences with this game. <clears throat> there are similarities and differences. And one of the differences is in the old game, you had to actually take off on your plane. In this game, you shoot straight up in the air, vertical takeoff and landing. And then you'll notice that when you shoot up in the air, the screen doesn't move. Okay, so to get the screen to move, you have to go to the upper left-hand part of the screen to start the scroll. One of the things this game can let you do is actually you can stop the scroll of the screen completely if you want to by going all the way to the, to the diagonally to the lower right-hand side of the screen. Uh, you move your ship di with the diagonal direction to your joysticks, and up and down will this make your uh, your UFO go uh, higher and lower in altitude. All right. Yep. So right away, that's a turn off if you've played the old game because it's just it's different, and it's it's not totally different from the original Blue Max, but I'd say it's different enough to cause people trouble. When you start the game and you don't start the screen scrolling, that in itself is discombobulating. It takes a little while to get used to. Uh, once you get your ship up and running and you're scrolling across the screen, uh, you'll notice that the landscape is a lot browner than you remember. Of course, you're not on Earth. You're on, a, you're on uh, uh, Earth Base 4, whatever it was, which is a cratered up, you know, moonish looking joint. So you're gonna, you don't get the kind of splashes of color, 
kind of the neat geometry that you did for the original game. Uh, this game uses a lot of the similar, uh, uh, you know, g g screen uh, screen alerts that you would have expected in the old one. Uh, there's a bar at the bottom, just like in the old one, and if the bar turns different colors depending on what's happening. If it's red, you've you've gotten hit. If it's blue, you're on the same uh, hor you're on the same level as as your other opponent that's altitude, in the air. Yeah. That's right, altitude. Thank you, Brent. If it's brown, then you're at strafing alpha altitude, and if it's yellow, you're getting ready to uh, to hit the ground. Okay, pretty. It's it sounds complicated. It's not that bad once you get used to it. You're going to notice once you take off that it's going to flash through the colors because you're going through the dangerous area to the you know to up in the air. Uh, you also can take you sustain damage in this just like you did in the old one. Uh, you can have your gun shot. You can have the fuel tank shot. You can have your bomb dropping uh, abilities lessened, you know. So that's and you can also be shot to where you can't maneuver like you could beforehand. Maneuverability and these are represented by letters that will appear on the screen in the bar to tell you what's wrong. This is all very very similar to Blue Max. It's exactly the same way that Blue Max is now. So far, we've talked about the the way everything looks and the way your ship moves. Let's talk about what you're shooting here. Uh, much like Blue Max, you're going to go across lots of roads, uh, bridges, that sort of thing. This game is split into different levels that you access by blowing up certain things, depending on your play method. And we'll talk about the options here in a second. Uh, as you go through the game, for the most part, you're doing what you did in Blue Max. You're bombing buildings and cars and, and futuristic space-looking buildings. Stuff that shoots like fire, like uh, electric up in the air, stuff like that. Uh, you're also hounded in this game by a couple different UFOs. One is sort of a bigger deal, and then there's this sort of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, cigar-shaped or something, UFO. This is the one that really bothers you because it literally hounds you everywhere you go to the point where if you're on the base uh, getting refueled, he'll just casually fly over take a few minutes to look around, and then come over and drop a bomb on you. I mean, he, and, he, and he'll do it almost every time. He is a a, a pain. He sort of reminds me, Brent, remember, the, remember when we played the cartoon games and we and we played the bangers and mash? Remember that ghost that was always on your tail? And you just couldn't yeah, get rid of yeah. That's this, this is this game's ghost. It just won't stop. And so you can shoot him, but he'll come back. They, all, they always come back. Uh, so that guy's always on your butt. So... A lot of people are going to hate this game for the controls. A lot of people are going to hate this game for the way it looks. And probably not too many of them took the time to read the manual to even understand how to advance the game. Because you have to, if you didn't read the manual to advance the game, you're boned. I had to go and look for, look to see what the heck you're supposed to do in this game. Because there are two things you need to, to take care of before you can advance the to the next like level of the game, okay? Did you know about these, Brent? Yes. Okay, so and I'm assuming you read the manual, right? No, I, I watched someone beat the game. Oh, okay. So you, yeah, that would also help, which that wasn't a uh, an option back in the day. So you've got one of you've got an object that is is like it's basically like this. Uh, how to describe it? It's like a uh, circle with like a spinning thing in the middle of it. It's 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 a pretty. It's a, it's not something that stands out, if I'm honest. Almost like a gyro. That's right. But, I mean, it doesn't look... It's not like... You're not going to look at it and be like, wow, that's impressive. You know, it no, just looks it, like it's a... it's very brown and and and, and uh, fits in with the environment. You have to be looking for right, it. Right, exactly. Once you destroy this and then land again, then you will advance to what the next level, which is, by the way, that's as far as I got was the second portion of this game. The next level takes place on a series of roads and platforms built over water, all right? Uh, which basically it's replaced the uh, they basically replaced the uh, the brown and the uh, craters with water and it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, and then you, you do the exact same thing and ultimately you'll get to the point where you're actually bombing this big square area and if you do it if you do it in a certain in the right sequence enough times you eventually can it in the game. Okay, that's basically that, this game does have an ending. But I doubt many people got to that, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, this game has the same control setup that the original game did. You can actually go into the options menu, and you can pick 
a value of the function keys, whether you want to turn gravity on and off, where you want the controls to be in pilot mode, you know, reversed. You can also change the difficulty level. I I juice the difficulty level up to see how hard it got. It gets extremely hard. Yeah. Uh, they there's uh, in fact, did you ever play on anything but the basic level, Brent? Uh, just to just to pee. Right. It was just super. It was super tough. Yeah. You can also change uh, one of the options. I thought this was kind of an odd option. There's an option where you can make it so instead of having to blow up the thing to go to the next level, you have to physically land on it. Yeah. Which would be, that would be tougher. There's no doubt about it because, wait, I mean, the funny thing about this game is we've mentioned you can stop the scroll of the screen, okay? That is powerful, but it's also sort of a pain. It can be confusing. And I think that's the name of the game here is is how confusing the game's controls can get. It was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty uh, um, forward-thinking game, giving you the abilities, all the abilities to do what you can do, plus stop the scroll and move around the screen. But it makes the game, uh, I think, probably uh, one and a half times as difficult to control as Blue Max. Now, the funny thing is, I read a lot of people that said this game was too hard. But for the most part, I didn't think this game was harder than Blue Max. I thought Blue Max is uh, at Far least easier. as harder. But just because once you understand how the UFO operates, you can be pretty deadly. I know one thing. I was a lot more deadly with air-to-air -air combat than I was in Blue Max because you can, you've got plenty of time to stop what you're doing, change altitudes, hone in on your enemy, and blow them away. I think bombing is not nearly as uh, satisfying in this. There's not some of the little touches from the original game, like the cars driving around and stuff, and, and more clear targets. The bridges in this don't actually go over water. They just sort of go over the road, so it's not quite as fun. There's, in, On the early level, there's no real river. The targets aren't as uh, plentiful or as fun. And as you go through this game, you'll realize that you're basically going over the same chunk of land over and over. It's just they slightly move the uh, landing strip for you to refuel. It takes forever to refuel your UFO, which is a pain. But one thing I did notice is, if you were landed and the guy came over to bomb your landing strip, you could just go up in the air, blow him away, and then just come back down. Yeah. You could just land over and over. So there's no reason to go forward or backwards past your landing bay until you're completely refueled and prepared. You could leave early, but it's I, I wouldn't unless you absolutely have to. But I mean, you, if you're landing, you're going to have to jump up and deal with the guys coming to get you and go back down. This was an odd title. Uh, the Brent. When I played this back uh, originally, I hated it. I mean, I hated this when I played it. We only played it a few times. We're like, this is crap. And when I looked at the reviews and the and the, and the uh, reviews that were sitting into the web pages and stuff, this game was almost universally panned, except by a few people. I mean, everyone talked about how much they didn't like it. What did had you played this before? What did you think of it? I, you know, going back to it, I don't think I had played this before. Yeah. Uh, first, let's address the elephant in the room. This sequel is not that much different from its from yeah. its original. I, and I, I listen. I really thought it was. I mean, and I think you did too when you agreed to let me do it. Well, it's like I said, different. I thought I knew what this game was, and I and I did not. I, I, I'm right there with you on that. I'm right there. Um, so that's that. I I'm fairly confident this is even the same engine that yeah. Blue Max was built yes, off of. Yes, I agree. I agree with that wholeheartedly. So, uh. Blue Max. I, I love Blue Max. It's one of my go-to games whenever I, I fire up from these uh, from anything that can support it and uh, enjoy the heck out of it. Playing this, uh, I knew everyone hated this game and I went in expecting to hate it as well and I did not. Um, In the same the game, exact way. The game is... Is it different from Blue Max? Yeah, mainly in its controls. Uh, if you don't take the time to learn the controls and understand that up and down is just altitude, you can't just move up the screen. You have to use your diagonals. Uh, you can hold the fire button and shoot in eight directions. Yep. That comes in very handy. Once you figure out the color changes of the screen, uh, to, you know, what different, you know, the main one you need to know is when the screen turns blue, you're on the same level as air enemies in your area. Just like the original. Yeah. yeah. When you figure out that there are things you need to do, 
there are items you need to pick up or bomb, uh, and then you get to a airfield, and you have to take out all the planes from the airfield as they launch up. Now, one thing about that is you couldn't bomb the enemies on the airfield, which I thought was kind of silly because that's what they do to you. Uh, I guess they thought that would make it too easy. <coughs> um, I never beat the game. Uh, I did watch someone beat it. I never beat the uh, game. Yeah. Um, I didn't think it was difficult per se. Uh, I, I played for I could play for 30, 35 minutes on a guy. Oh yeah, and, you could go for a while. And normally, the reason why I would die is I would go to take off or land or fly low. And I would screw up myself, and I'd hit up to go up the screen, just slam it into the ground. Yeah. And I would have not enough damage to take, and I'd blow up. You really need to get all the altitude you can when you take off, and get just to get the scroll going. That way, yeah. you don't have to worry about that happening. Yeah. Uh. So, is this better than Blue Max? No, I, I don't think so. I think Blue Max has a a bit of a charm to it. Uh, by restricting your freedoms and forcing you to fly up the screen. And forcing you to deal with uh, situations as they appear in Blue Max, it makes the game more exciting. Anytime I got pressured in this game, I would just stop the scroll, shoot the enemies, or whatever. And it, that that made it less compelling to uh, really fight through my fight through the situations. I could just stop the situations from from getting worse. So. I don't think it's better than Blue Max, but I do not think this game deserves near the hate that it gets. I think people uh, aren't willing to accept that they tried to evolve the series, and I, I get that. They kind of screwed around with something that was classic and worked. They jumped way too forward in time, uh, but I enjoyed my time with this game, and I would if you are someone who hasn't played Blue Max 2001, and you hear all the bad things that they say about it, and that's why you haven't checked it out. No, go check it out. Yeah, you know, learn the controls. Yeah, learn that you have to move with the diagonals and up and down is your altitude. Learn that you can press the button and shoot in uh, in eight different directions. Once you take care of that, it's a fairly entertaining game. Although it does get old because it it's very looping. You see a whole lot of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's eerie how similar are, and this doesn't happen that often. I, you pretty much summed up everything I was going to say right there. This game, you know, your UFO sort of reminds me of like if you took the Cosmic Arc and put it in the Blue Max zone. Remember Cosmic Arc? You, sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and which also that would also fit the theme. And the theme of this is dopey. All right. Then if you read the 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 manual, it's that's dopiness. So stick all that, get that out of here. But giving you, I mean, I'll give the guy credit because it is really different. I think he made a few tactical. I don't think it's really different. Well, I think I mean, it's different. The controls are really advanced. But I think he yes. made a few overstretches. I think the ability to stop the screen is a detriment to the game, not because it doesn't work right, but because it necessitates that alien that always comes out to hound you. You know, because with the screen stopped, you don't ever have to go anywhere. There's no reason to if there's no enemy. And so to move the game along, he had to put an enemy in here that always is on your tail, and I, which I, I don't like that. Uh, he also took away the urgency in some ways because, like I said, you can go anywhere. You can stop the screen. You can take your time if you want to. And so that changes things. Uh, it's That makes the game feel a lot different than Mad Max. You're right. The artificial constraints are in Blue Max. The artificial constraints in Blue Max give the game its fun factor. Yeah. Is this game as fun as Blue Max? No. Is it as attractive as Blue Max? No. Uh, but is it a garbage game? Absolutely not. There's fun yeah. to be had here. I would have done things. You know, if I had done it, <clears throat> if it was me, I would have had this game be like a, a ZV or something where you just get to the end of the level and then you go to the next level. Change the levels up. You know what I'm saying? None of this bomb this one obscure thing. Because the funny thing about it is the thing you need to bomb it's not like it takes 20 minutes to show up. It comes right away. And yeah. so you can just go and blow it up, and then, bam, you're on the next level, and you can, you can zoom right past it. On the flip side, if you don't get it, you're just endlessly scrolling across the same uh, 
the same uh, landscape. I guarantee you that's why most people hate this game. It's the controls, and they couldn't figure out how to get anywhere, so they just thought this was the whole game, just yeah. endlessly scrolling, and then they, they canned it. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. Uh, I looked up a little bit of action on this game to see how it did. There wasn't a ton of critical response to it. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> there was the reception of this thing was a little bit not that good, as you can imagine. Uh, I, I found uh, on Moby, they said Ahoy called the C64 release an exciting sequel which extends and refines the elements which made the original game popular while it introduces enough new challenges to generate fresh excitement. I was surprised that someone put it over because everyone else killed it. Zap64 called it one of the most disappointing sequels of all time. Uh, the reviewer oh, no. the reviewer wrote the graphics are very poor and called out the jelly mold ship and the wonky perspective. He hated the controls. Atari Magazine also said it was a disappointment. It's, they said it's a nightmare to fly. They called the UFO a polo mint. <laughs> and they said uh, the the way you operate is with far less accuracy. And uh, they didn't like it. Uh, Bill Gunkel, the, the very famous Bill Gunkel in Atari Explorer, wrote that the game was plagued with ridiculous terminology and some of the shoddiest documentation since the days when computer software was sold in baggies. Now, I mean, it wasn't that bad, Bill. No, My God. no. That's uh, harsh for the sake of being harsh. Antic commented that the game, the Atari version had fairly good graphics with some interesting touches. Uh, I will say I looked at both versions. I think that in this case, you know, I, I prefer the Atari version of Blue Max or the C64 version. But I will say the C64 version of this seems to be better to me for some reason. Eh. Uh, the review, I mean, they're pretty similar. The, yeah. There is one great song in the game. I mean, if you let it run, it, yeah. it doesn't play during gameplay, but it's an excellent song. Uh, the reviews on this, Lim, the people over at Lemon give this a 4.7 out of 10. And the video game critic, a more modern uh, take, gives this a 25%. Just, just killed this That's game. That's insane. Uh, That's we, insane. Well, no, again, Brett, I think this, they, they didn't get into it enough. We did get one review here from our good buddy, The Boat, John Boat of Car Schaller. What do you think Boat's going to say about this, one, Brent? I got an idea. Uh, <laughs> this game... Clearly, uh, this game, clearly based on the Blue Max engine, is an example of how, with a few tweaks, you could ruin a really fun game. Because you now have the ability to start and stop your craft, you will stop and start your craft multiple times throughout the level, but will be completely unable uh, to do it on command, which you have to do to land. I will say the C64 version of this game is more colorful and sports a better HUD than the Atari 8-bit. I grew up playing... But it still lives in the shadows of the the original game's greatness. I think that's a that's a pretty fair look at it from the boat. Uh, you know, it is what it is. It's not the best game. It's not the worst game. It's just, but it's certainly doesn't deserve all the hate that it got. Uh, I uh, looked this thing up on the eBay Brent uh, just to see if there was any sort of action on it. And guess what? There's no sort of action on it. Uh, I didn't see any boxed copies up there. So. I'm guessing this game didn't sell that well either, if I'm honest. I think what happened was that is the fellow took the original engine, took out some of the restraints, changed the graphics, made some mild, mild modifications, and sent it out there to die, unfortunately. And, and then quit making games. So this this could be real be the game that took him out of the industry. It's an interesting look uh, into uh, uh, you know his career, such as it was. He came in on a high note. He left on a low note. But at least the high note is still famous to this day. You can't complain Absolutely. about that. So, that was Blue Max 2001 for the C64. Now, Brent, you went in an entirely different direction, didn't you? Well, yeah. I When I heard sequels that were different from the original, I thought, hey, I'll pick a game that's different from the original. Well, now, wait a minute before you bury me. You okayed that game and gave me no crap because you thought it was different just like I did. So, don't give me that. Uh-huh. So, like I was saying, I picked a game that was actually different from the original. I picked a Zelda 2, <coughs> The Adventures of Link. Of course, a direct sequel, one of the very few direct Zelda sequels from The Legend of Zelda, both on the Nintendo 64, or on the Nintendo 64. Wow. Yeah, well, probably so somewhere. Uh, both from the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, the original Zelda, for those who have never heard of it or somehow are brand new to retro gaming. Uh, one of the highest selling games on the Nintendo uh, was a top-down perspective, 
as you traversed many lands, collected money, dealt with merchants, uh, found magical items on your quest to eventually reconstruct the Triforce and uh, go after the big baddie Ganon. So when they did Zelda 2, <coughs> apparently they said, you know what? Screw you, Zelda team. We're getting whole new people except for the, the big man and uh, the story developer and made a completely different game, uh, which became Adventures of Link. This game released on the Famicom Disk System, the the ill-fated system over in Japan that never made its way to America in 1987, uh, and then the the PAL and uh, North American release was released in 1988, uh, almost a full two years apart. Were there big when you're differences looking at, in the two? Do you know? There are. There okay. are. Yeah. In fact, there are plenty of differences. Way, I'll go over some of them, but there are way too many to mention. So, <clears throat> first thing you have to to realize when you see this game is uh, when they put this together, their goal was to make a game where you could block and attack high and low. That was before it was a Zelda game, before any of the story was in place. That was the, the mechanic that Miyamoto wanted to explore. A, a game where you can attack and block high and low. Sort of like Gladiator in the arcade, right? Isn't it the game that you could do that you used to love? Yeah, yeah, yeah that has an, a, a high, middle, and low. Yeah. yeah, I love that game, by the I way. I know, I know. So, uh, from there, he gave this to a, a brand new team and said, let's do something, let's make something off this. And slowly it evolved, and, and they had the side perspective <laughs> and uh, started pulling in more and more uh, like the magic system and experience points, try to make it, it was sort of like a Castlevania type feel. And they incorporated the up and down attack, you know, the high and low attack and the high and low block. And they were having some difficulties on how to sell it, right? They had the core there, but now what are you going to do to actually sell this thing and they said you know what let's let's we'll turn it we'll make it a zelda game and then they started to work off that so they had the base game and then they said okay this is good how are we going to market this how are we going to sell it let's make it a zelda game everyone was on board but the new team didn't know i mean this was this was a sequel to zelda and it was going this entirely new direction and as we know now, Miyamoto disliked Zelda 2. Uh, he, he considers it one of his worst games, definitely the worst of the Zelda series, and he said that they wanted to do so much more with the game, but the, the restrictions of the console ultimately doomed it to be what it was. Uh, now, one thing I want to say right up front, this is my favorite Zelda game from the retro era. I absolutely love this game. Uh, I, I thought all of the changes were for the best. I love the direction they took it. I loved the attack system. It made it more dynamic. I love the experience and the magic. And it, even though it did make it a little more D&D, &D, which I don't think was their intent. Uh, so just to get my, my personal feelings out of the way, I absolutely love this game. Uh, they expected this game to flop. Uh, they had no confidence in it, so much so that in Japan, this came out on the disc system. So discs were no problem. Uh, it sold well. It sold in extremely well. <clears throat> but the delay getting it to America, uh, one, was due to lack of confidence. But two, was there was a chip shortage going on at the time. And they were like, man, we could only put out so many games you know we only have so many chips let's let's put it over there let's well first of all let's wait to see what to let this chip shortage get better but now let's get it out there let's see how it does and it sold like hotcakes they could not keep this game on the shelf because they didn't make enough of them due to the ship the chip shortage and the the low confidence 
So Nintendo is kind of like, huh, we didn't expect that. Well, let's put more out there. And the more they put on the shelf, the more they sold. Ultimately, worldwide, this sold 4.38 million copies, which today doesn't sound like much, but back then was incredible. This was the sixth highest selling, I think it was sixth. Um, Let me see if I can find it real quick. I believe this was the sixth highest selling uh, Nintendo game of all time, which that says something. You mean the NES game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh So what is Zelda 2? How does it play? How does it differ? Well, it's a side-scrolling adventure where you uh, have a map system to navigate the overworld, and your goal is to wake a sleeping uh, Princess Zelda who has been basically cursed, and you have to gather these Triforces to to wake her back up. And the evil side of things is trying to bring Ganon back from the dead. They're trying to get these Triforces and resurrect uh, Ganon because you killed him in the last game. So you have a side-scrolling perspective through 80% of the game. You gather items just like you did the other game, Uh, candles to light up dark areas, rafts so you can travel across water, hammers to destroy boulders, that sort of thing. Uh, But you also have a leveling system, and the leveling system increases your attack power. It increases your life total, how how many damage you can take, and it increases your magic meter, which is your mana meter, totally absent from the original game. And the mana meter allows you to catch spells. Spells were not a thing in the original game. And the spells vary greatly. You can cast shields on yourself. You can make yourself jump farther. You can make yourself throw fireballs. Uh, You can turn yourself into a fairy and and fly through keyholes. The game was just uh, so new and so fresh of a take on the Zelda uh, world that I, it was really something that they took the chance to do this and, and to to I don't want to say they slapped a, a Zelda tie, a Zelda name onto it, but they they were not confident, and I wish they were because the, the evolution of this game this was its first step. It could have always been a top down game, uh, and it would have probably fizzled out after a while. Like we talked in the beginning, games have to evolve to to stay relevant. And I think this moving to a side-scrolling per- perspective, uh, even if you don't like it, you have to respect that they cha- made these changes, which allowed the game to continue to evolve to the 3D realm, to this big story epics that we have now. Uh, so that's something I, 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 well, I hold it in high regard anyway, but it is something that I really really enjoy from the series. Aaron, I know you've played this. Mm. Oh, so what did you think? Well, first of all, did you play the original Zelda much? I, I, I've played all the Zeldas before this one. And we, of course we owned this. Yeah. Uh, so I played it quite a bit back in the day. Okay. Uh, so first, what did you think of Zelda, the original Zelda? I'm pretty, I think people pretty much know. No, no, thought. what did you, you think? Oh, yeah, I'm getting to it. People, okay. I, I, most people pretty much know what I thought about. I didn't, I don't like any of the of the Zelda games. Okay. That, I don't like that, that top down. I, I thought it was crap, to be, if I'm honest. Okay. I know people love them. I mean, that them. shows you're wrong, but that's well, fine. I know people love them, but I didn't like them. And so, when this one honed into view, I'm like, now we're talking. This is something I could get into, because this is more arcadey you're jumping around you're firing you get the shield uh, and i will say uh, this it's again this is uh, very odd to me but we both agree again this is far and away my favorite of those old get zelda games uh, because this is more like a fun game to me this is more like something i can get my uh, sink my teeth into uh, it, you know uh years later there was an arcade game called cat ash that sort of took this uh gameplay style to the arcades sure uh, that, and they have something in common including the leveling and, and whatnot 
Uh, I think this game, you know, for it's interesting to me to hear that this wasn't originally planned as a Zelda because I think they Zelda it up quite nicely, if I'm honest. Well, it, I mean, it's got a lot of the elements very, that you expect. Very early on, yeah. they they turned it into a Zelda game. The yeah. original concept, though, was just I want to I want to be able to attack high and low, I mean, and that evolved from there. Is this game d fun? Yeah. Is it difficult? Yes. Oh it's yeah. A, in fact, some parts of it are rock hard. All right. I mean, there's some hard elements in this game, and it's not easy at any juncture. And there's also still Zelda stuff in that I don't like. All the random encounters that you sort of need to do to to build your guy up. I hate that crap. If it was if it was me, if I was gonna put this game together, it would just be a straight like it would just be a run through. You run through the levels. There would be no. I would probably even completely take out the random encounter elements. But I know that's part of the game. And that's something that's, that came right from the original Zelda where you had to do all that crap. Uh, thankfully, I mean, you're not forever fighting grass and barrels in this like you were in the original. Uh, I thought this game was a lot of fun. I mean, was it my? It, I didn't think it was in the same ballpark as, say, a, a Super Mario. But, I mean, I, it was a, a quantum leap to, to me ahead of the other Zeldas. Now, I know it's funny because... When we had this back in the day, and I thought it was a pretty popular game, but I'm guessing that over the years, this one's become sort of like the pariah of the Zelda games, if I'm not mistaken. And I know just saying you like it make people think you're a geek, but I mean, of the game, of the Zelda games, I thought this was my favorite. I think the sound's good. It's funny that when you die and you see Ganon, you hear the uh, the giggling from Punch Out. I yeah. want to put. I want to point that out. Yeah. Ganon's got one of the Punch Out guys' voice. Ganon's well Dude, drawn. Soda Pop Kaczynski. That's right. He's well drawn. He looks good on that screen. The graphics on this, I think, are nice. I think they do a good job. Like I said, they a lot of it looks a lot like sort of like a Super Mario in the way in the structure of it. But it's nice. The adventure elements are fun. It's not mega complicated where I'm totally screwed. You know, you uh, there are secrets. Uh, I thought it was, I I dug this. Now again, is it? Am I gonna go out today and go pop this in the old NES? Probably not. But Going back to it this week, I think I appreciated it a little bit more because I was a little bit better under control of how the combat works and stuff as I was in my younger days. Uh, and this sort of game, I mean, I, I'm not going to say they started the trend, but I mean, there wasn't a ton of games like this that I could remember at home. You could probably shed more light into that. Uh, but it was, and it was sort of D&D-like, which was, hey, that's not a bad thing. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm not saying it's my favorite, but it's certainly my favorite of the old Zeldas. And, so you know, I actually, I, I know this is the way it is, because I've obviously I've played the game to death. I've beaten it dozens of times on, on multiple platforms. But in the original game, you farmed for money. In this game, there is no money. And I did not realize that. I mean, obviously I knew it, but I didn't realize that they took that out of the game until I read somewhere online. Yeah, this has no roof, no money in it, no shops, no uh, uh, that sort of interaction with the environment. And that's crazy. I don't know if it's the only game because Zelda, the Zelda franchise has expanded to incredible uh, uh franchises many 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 games i have obviously have not played them all there's just so many now on so many different platforms but this is definitely the first of the zelda games that didn't have money being that it was the second game but i think it's one of the only games that didn't have any kind of money all of your items are found through exploration uh in town the 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 citizens of the town <laughs> will heal you and give you magic for free because you're trying to, you know, help Zelda. That's the way it should be. I always That's hate exactly that in how it should be. Making you pay for. We're trying to save your hineys, you stupid town. I hate it. I hate that in every game. Yeah. So you know that's that's something that I, I never really thought about, but that's that's how adventure games I've always felt should be, and, and this is one that is. Uh, just a few real quick differences between the disc version and the version we got over in North America. Uh, we get more bosses. Uh, there are a couple bosses that are repeats in the Japanese version when, when we get uh, new ones. <clears throat> the leveling system is much more difficult in the uh, North American release. 
uh, the cost to level up uh, gets exponentially higher, where the, it maxes out at 3,000 for the last level on the Japanese version. It is 8,000 for the North American release. How you level is even different. Um, I like how you can pick what tier, and the tiers are cheaper between attack, magic, and life. Uh, that's different than the Japanese version. Uh, a little bit of trivia. There's a guy famously in the game that, say, that says, I am error. Uh, and everyone always thought that that was an error. It was a fluke. It was a mess up. No, that was an inside joke that they put in. And a guy in another town says, I am Bagu, which in Japanese means bug. So that was just a, a bit of inside humor that they tried to put out there. And it, it didn't, everyone thought it was an actual bug. <laughs> um, uh, some other things. The uh, uh, ending screen, where you have that Soda Popsinski laugh, isn't in the disc version. In the disc version, it, it's just a big roar sound. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Let me see if I can think of a few other things. Just fun little tidbits here. So you're saying um, the, the you're saying the American non-disc version is actually it's harder, but there's more content than the disc version had. That's right. Okay. It, it, it's harder and has more content. Interesting. Um, the only other side-scrolling games like this uh, out there in the world are the CDI versions. Oh, man. And it is believed, obviously we'll never know this for sure, but it is believed that it is those CDI versions that killed any other side-scrolling Zelda game from existing. Uh, they, I guess it got a bad reputation at that point. Uh, so... No kidding. When you're, when you're flipping, <laughs> when you're flipping through Zelda games, and you hear everyone hating on Zelda Two, if you have not played this game yourself, please give it a try. Uh, the combat is so dynamic. The up and down block system is so well implemented. Uh, if you're like, man, I just hate Zelda games. I'm not gonna play one. End of story. Check out a game called Battle of Olympus. It is the exact same game, uh, except skinned with uh, uh, Olympus and that sort of setting. But the combat is the same, the up-down combat. Uh, it does have a lot of grinding for money, which, of course, this game doesn't have. But it's also one of my favorite NES games. I wish that they had stuck with their guns with this i wish magic and leveling and experience became a staple for the for the series it did not uh, in case in light something's changed way down the line uh they completely axed those implements in later zelda games some games will still have magic but most this part of magic where you're casting spells and stuff completely void from all the other games so, uh, if you want to get this game, it is released on 18 bajillion systems. The Nintendo, where I owned it, the Game Boy Advance, where I also owned it, and pretty much every Nintendo virtual shop out there will get you a chance to get this game. So, you have no excuse. Pick it up. Give it a shot. Yeah. Aaron, did, any closing thoughts on you, it? Did you get a, any eBay on this? Oh, what version? I mean, you can. Yeah, it's, I it's noticed easily that. attainable. That was my, that was my <laughs> question. It seems like there's about ten versions of the game yeah. around. Uh, so yeah, but I mean, I, it looks like you get one for thirty, forty bucks if you're really after it. Uh, yeah. So there you go. No, I I dug this. Like I said, it, per, for me, I prefer a game like Kadash, uh, but just because there's it takes out some of the kind of dumber elements of this that I don't like. But still, as far as these games though, I think this one is kind of a winner. And kind of one that needs to be revisited by all the grumps. Speaking <laughs> of grumps, oh, no one's grumpy. Would we oh, forget to okay. do John's review? <laughs> I almost dropped the ball there and just rolled right past the the uh, Discord. We actually got one, Brent. So I'm going to stop myself <laughs> right there before I use my pitch. Uh, in fact, it was from our own John Buttercar Shaw, and the reason I remember it's because he bad mouths me in this review. He says, "Aaron, this is the only Zelda game that's an RPG." 
Its level up mechanics and enemy statistical information make it years ahead of games that would borrow it from the 60 and 32 bit era. Unfortunately, the game's dungeons are so difficult that I could never make a significant progress when I was younger. Going back to it now, I appreciate, just like the first game in the series, how original it was. There were there was simply nothing else like it on the market when it was released in 1987. So he puts it over big time, Brent. There you go. And, I will and it put deserves it to be put over big time. It correct. was a terrific game. Let's put over the wheel, Brent. Let's get this thing out of here. <laughs> so, so, eventually we got to it. This week, Brent, I've got the wheel in hand here. We've got two new pieces our uh, Retro Rewind piece this week, the Commodore 16. Very popular episode we did a while back. And the uh, new piece we've applied this week, the Psycho SH2, suggested by Rushi. That sounds cool. It's Psycho. That's <laughs> it a- sounds something. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it sounds kind of neat. So, any, anything you would like to see spun today? It is burger based games burger on the based, wheel? It is. It is on here. All right, I, I'm hoping for that. That's a stupid. That's a stupid category. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, that's how you do it, right there, brother. And the winner Orly? is uh oh, right out of the oh, gate. Oh man, right out of the gate. It's Psycho SH2 from Rushi. Britt, what do you know about the Psycho SH2? Well, I know that next week is our episode 200. And we are looking at something I've never heard of. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know what this is, but something tells me. I, I've got this sneaking suspicion. Maybe this is a cheap handheld. That's usually when they have a the dumber the name, I've noticed. The cheaper the handheld. Britt, you touched on it. Next week, we'll be celebrating our 200th episode. Big extravaganza. Uh, we're hoping to get together and do it live. Uh, and Brent's been feverishly working on some stuff to get. We're gonna we're gonna do a little psycho, and then we're gonna I'm gonna team up with a psycho, aka the Brent, for some hot uh, episode 200 action. We wouldn't have got here without our our good buddies and our listeners helping us along the way. We appreciate all you guys, everyone on Patreon helping us out, uh, everyone that's ever tuned in. We appreciate it, and uh, we will uh, do our best to have a good time this week. I guess that sounds a little bit weird. We'll always have a good time, but we'll do our best to have a great time. How's that? I got a few things I want to talk about real quick uh, to uh, get to get over before the before I forget them. Basically, uh, you know, we had a little thing, Brent, called the Amigathon, uh, and it was in in July or August, and it did quite well. And I, there were certain goals that were met, and so I have to pay my debt. To the people that Amigathon that got this goal over because people demanded for some reason that I am get to play a nothing but Barbie games, the big Barbie stream. So that stream will take place Friday the 14th, starting at 8 30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's an all Barbie stream from your good buddy Amiga Aaron. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. I've lined up a bunch of unusual Barbie titles, but I know you're intrigued by this. Yeah, and it will be it'll be a lot of fun. Now, let's splash forward to February, uh, to January twenty first of uh, twenty twenty two. Just in a couple weeks, the twenty first, the week after the Barbie stream, it will be the return of conversations from the dark side, Brent. The dark side, and this time the topic is going to be UFO encounters. Brent, you ever seen a UFO? No. no. Not, are you are you buying it? No. You're not buying, you don't believe in aliens? Oh my god, I listen to you. So, oh, do I think there's life out there somewhere? Sure. Yeah. Just listen. not no, no one's coming down and 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 poking farmers in the butt. You know, Blue Max t- 2001 ties directly to my belief with UFOs. So, I'm just going to if you read the backstory, that's pretty much the way it sums it up. And then finally, and this is the big one, Brent, Saturday, uh January 29th, 4 o'clock p.m. It all goes down. It will be the International Computer Club meeting. We've got a, we're literally locked and stocked with presenters on the International Computer Club. It's going to be a happening. You can tune in to see all these things on this exact same Twitch channel, and they will eventually uh, appear on YouTube more than likely. I'm not sure about the Barbie stream. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can live without one. Been out in the YouTube. <laughs> 
<laughs> it might happen. So that we've got the next two Fridays and Saturday are going to be a, a big deal with the Brent. Do you have yes. anything to add to this before we take it to the house? Uh, one more shout out, even though I know we're not supposed to, for for boat th- uh boat uh, uh the boat fest. Man. Sorry, I had a megathon on the brain. A uh, boat fest. If you haven't got your tickets, get them now. Yeah, boat fest it is going to be happening. The Brent, uh, the people are lining up. And it should be a good time. Uh, the hotel that the uh, boat fest is taking place should be plenty of available rooms there uh, that th- for that weekend. And uh, my God, we're gonna not only we're we gonna have the boat fest there at the hotel, but there'll probably be some trips to the Mothman. There'll be some trips down to the Hillbilly Flea Market, perhaps, or possibly even down to the uh, Coal Miners Lounge if we feel particularly round. No, you know, no, well, that's you, a bad idea. Listen. That's where the coal miners hang out, Brent. All the coal miners in Milton, they go right to the coal miners' lounge. When was the last time they mined coal in Milton? Did they ever mine coal there? Probably not. So, next week, the Psycho SH2 and episode 200. Please join us. We'd appreciate it. And until then, so long. Thanks for joining us today. Special thanks to Duncan Styles for our vector style graphic and Bart Pitt for our amazing music. Would you like to help keep ARG spinning? You can do so at patreon.com slash ARG presents, just like these fine folks. Mario Ramey, Z9K9, Jerry Dennington, John Dykeman, Retroalgy, Airshack, Texas Foosballer, Sundown, Orom, Super Tech Boy, David Terrence, Mr. B, Rauchy, Graham W. Vetke, Dave Velociraptor, Bernhard Lucas, Steve Rathmason, Anthony Jarvis, Bitter Blitter, Pajaco6502, Kevin Bean, Andy Jones, Andy Craig, Rob Flack O'Hara, Jason Warrens, Mitsuyama, Chris Foles, Frodo and L. The Slowness. Gary Heather, Terry Howard, Olaf Hope, and Rollo. You can join us live every Sunday, 10 a.m. EDT, on Twitch. Hope to see you there. Thanks for...